If there are people, you know, who've got questions, comments for people on our panel, you know, take advantage of this point now. Let's start over that side. Hi there, Tan Copsey, BBC Media Action. Um, my question to the panel as a whole is what role do they think communications can play in adaptation, particularly in Asia, because that's our focus. Thank you, Cass. I work with Christian Aid. Um, we talk quite a lot about climate justice too. And I'm interested to know if it's the so-called rich that have caused a problem for the so-called poor, how does anyone on the panel think that we could most effectively repay our debt? And I don't mean necessarily with money. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, I think one of the most powerful um, elements of the climate change issue to, to connect people is that it connects all six billion people on the planet. Every single one of us has a carbon footprint by virtue of what we eat, what we wear, where we live, how we travel. The magnitude of each of us, our carbon footprints varies by many orders of magnitude. Yours and mine are much higher than the global average. Your poor African peasants is very much smaller. And so the communication needs to be aimed at the audiences that you want to communicate to. The audience in the West, in London, is going to be very different from the audience in Bangladesh. But you have to know your audience and then tailor your communications to them. How to repay the debts? I think the, the, the main issue we are having is that all those, and especially us, who are consuming resources are doing so in a non-sustainable way. These resources are much too cheap. So we should pay much more for the resources we are consuming. It's as simple as that. But to put this into practice is the, is the problem. Because uh, your government, my government will say, oh, we, we have to reduce prices, otherwise we are not any more competitive and so on. So there are a lot of excuses. But if you don't change the price of resources and the cost of resources, we will not change the situation. I think that's a uh, problem. Okay, thanks very much. I know that there were a number of other questions. So I want to know what your views on the carbon offset market are, please. Political will is the number one most important thing that we need, you know, to make real systematic changes. I wonder if, if the panel could comment on whether that's possible without there being a sort of underlying feeling from the general population that there needs to be a change. I wonder if, if the action can take place without the anger, so to speak. What, what can developing world countries do to put pressure on the, the crazies in, in the US? Who wants to Shall go I and address? Start. Um, concerning um, angry, the, according to the statistics, the, uh, today the people in, in, in most affected countries, in poor countries, are much more <coughs> uh, susceptible to understand climate change than in the uh, industrialized world. And in, in the US, the the sympathy or the anger for climate change is going down rapidly. That's very dramatic. Now, I think uh, one of the solutions is why not are not Bangladeshi people going to the United States mm -hmm. to explain what means vulnerability mm -hmm. and how it, ca it can be done? Because what the Bangladeshis have been doing in terms of vulnerability against floods, against a cyclone, the Americans could learn from Bangladesh because some uh, country they, they were completely at loss. They didn't know what to do. Go to Bangladesh. If something like that happens, there's an immediate response. So I think that might be uh, a solution. Where offsetting more generally is concerned, I have to say that I'm extremely skeptical about it, not just in terms of how the economics of the, of the markets are constructed, but the very scientific validity of the idea of offsetting, because I think it resembles more a kind of carbon laundering. If you're hoping to swap a stable long-term store of carbon, like oil or coal, which might stay in the ground for millions of years, for um, forest cover, uh, when forests, depending upon how the climate responds, might be a sink of carbon, they might become a source of carbon. I think it's not changing like for like. Now, this is a, a conversation that Salim and I have had over many years, and we actually came up with the notion that rather than 
promising something which scientifically is extremely difficult to define and virtually impossible to <coughs> deliver in a real and meaningful way. A more meaningful thing to do might be to identify units of compensation, acknowledging that once you've burnt the stuff and it's in the atmosphere, as Salim was saying, it's going to hang around for decades and do damage. And the idea that you can do some sort of like-for-like -like replacement, I think, is, is not, not a sound one. But what you might construct is a regime in which you know, people might want to acknowledge the damage that they've done and do good things by making compensation <coughs> payments of some sort, which might acknowledge that the ecological debt that we've done and help fund adaptation. Response on the, on the US in general. I think one of the problems with the US and, and the Romney and the Republicans are, uh, and the Tea Party are, are reflection of that is that they're a world unto themselves. So you know, the US has shown itself to be totally um, unimpressed and not reachable through the international community. They've been isolated in the Kyoto Protocol. They don't give a damn. Ten years of Bush, they just rode it out. So international pressure, by and large, simply doesn't do anything uh, to change domestic action in the US. My own view of, of what might change are two things. Firstly, if the younger generation gets more on board and, and understands, and a lot of younger people are actually much more progressive than the older people are. Uh, but more importantly, I think what will make the US change is China. As China changes and as China moves towards the post-fossil fuel world, the US will realize that they are going to be beaten to that world by China. And you know, we, we need to wait for that. Sputnik moment when the US realizes that China is going to beat them to it. And then they, they'll put the resources and, and technology to work to beat China, not because it's a good thing to do and to help the rest of the world. It's for them not to be beaten by China. Interesting. Right. Yes, gentlemen here. <coughs> Uh, hi, Jeremy Lovell from Climate Wire. Um, an issue that hasn't been mentioned specifically tonight, but has, is fundamental to everything. Can the world deal with a population of 9 billion people within the next 40 years, while having everybody going to bed not hungry, and dealing with uh, the resistance of the Western world to give up their lifestyles, when the issue has dropped off the political agenda in the West, and the only model of economic success measures GDP, which is it, it, its sole measure of economic success is uh, relentless growth in consumption. Mm. Hi, I'm yeah. Ashling Irwin from SciDevNet, the Science and Development Network. Um, my question has partly been covered, but I wanted to know a little bit more about what Bangladesh is doing with its £250 million. Pounds. And you speculated that some of the things it's doing could be then taught to the richer world. And I wondered if you could maybe highlight one or two of the lessons that it feels could be more widely disseminated. My concern is that we are just targeting the same people and we're preaching to the converted. And I guess my question is, what are you, what are you doing to reach new audiences? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll roll the, the, uh, the population issue into the Bangladesh issue as well. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Bangladesh, this is the 40th anniversary of Bangladesh's independence. So 40 years ago, we separated out from Pakistan. One of the reasons why Bangladesh separated from Pakistan was a feeling within Bangladesh, or the East Pakistan at that time, that us being the majority of the population, we were not getting our democratic rights. The other side of the Pakistan equation, the West Pakistan, were a minority at that time. 40 years later, there's 170 million people in Pakistan and 150 million in Bangladesh. The growth rate in Pakistan is still 3%. In Bangladesh, it's come down to below 2%. Without coercion, in a predominantly Muslim society, primarily through girls' education, better family planning, better uh, birth, um, uh, childcare for mothers, and very importantly, getting the Islamic imam community on board to support family planning is a multitude of uh, ways in which a very, very significant reduction in population, about 20 or 30 people who, million people who would have been born were not born in, Bang in Bangladesh over the last 40 years because of these measures. So population control does not require drastic measures. It requires a lot of understanding. Girls' education is number one mm. in, in that list of things, but the other things 
can make it happen. These things didn't happen in Pakistan. They happened in Bangladesh. So it's a very clear example of bringing down <coughs> population, even under conditions of poverty. The country is still poor. Large numbers are poor, but we haven't had famines. We haven't had starvation. The growth rate, the food production has kept pace with the growth rate, and the country survives. The other question about what can others learn? Others can learn a lot. This country has 150 million people of very, very great resilience mm -hmm. and innovativeness and tenacity. They have survived many, many different problems. And that survival instinct and the ability to manage crises is something that other countries don't necessarily have. We had the example of Katrina in New Orleans. When the rich evacuated the city, they left the poor behind. Over a thousand people died in the richest country in the world. That wouldn't happen in Bangladesh. I'll give you the example of Bangladesh. In 1991, we had a cyclone that killed over 100,000 people. A few years ago, we had a similar-sized cyclone that killed less than 3,000 people. And most of those people that died were fishermen on boats who didn't get back in time. More than 3 million people on land were successfully evacuated to cyclone shelters. And this is a product of what one might call adaptation, although this was not for climate change, it was cyclones. A massive program since the previous cyclone of building cyclone shelters, of early warning systems with governments and Red Cross and volunteers and NGOs, school children being taught about what a cyclone warning meant and which one meant that they had to evacuate, and then the kids telling their parents and grandparents we have to go to the cyclone shelter and making them go. A whole host of soft measures that this country has put in place that successfully allowed them to save a lot of lives. There's still a lot of damage from the cyclone mm. to the agriculture, to the infrastructure, but lives lost was brought down by probably in the order of 100,000 people. A few months later, similar sized cyclone just came up the Bay of Bengal, veered east, and hit Myanmar, Cyclone Nargis. The government of Myanmar sat there watching. 100,000, 140,000 people in Myanmar died. Bangladesh is no richer than Myanmar. They just better organized. They got their act together. And they were able to save lives. And that is what adaptation is all about. That's what tackling the problem is about. It's not about technology. It's not about money. It's about getting your act together as a society and deciding what's important and doing things that are necessary. And that means the government doing it, NGOs doing it, civil society doing it, academics doing it, everybody doing their bit, but with a purpose. And that's what we have. And that's what we others can share and learn from. Yeah. I think you can find a general theme through all of those questions, um, which is really information. I mean, in terms of population, um, you know, what we need to do, as Dr. Huck said, is empower women and get information out about um, family planning uh, and to give them a chance of other alternative lives. I'll quote to you a figure that I often quote because it's so horrifying. There was a study done that found 50% of the babies born in Uganda were unwanted. Their mothers did not want to have a baby then, but they weren't able to see that they could, didn't. I think there is one important point uh, which seems to be important, namely GDP. I think there is a changing awareness and the readiness to discuss this. Um, may I recall that in the CBD uh, COP in Nagoya, it was decided that we should include the consumption of natural resources in the national accounts. Of course, uh, this sounds now very uh, cloudy, but there has been the president of World Bank. There has been ADP. They were ready to finance this, and they have nominated four pilot countries where this should be studied. How can we include the consumption of natural resources into the, in the national accounts so that we go away from the traditional growth-oriented GDP calculation? And in India today, we have a very high-level Indian committee, and they have the task to make proposals for the government to see whether this can be implemented and what are the consequences for India. So there is a change, and I think we should support this change, uh, because it is, it, this is very important. If World Bank is really ready to go about it, then uh, it, 
it has a leverage to change things. OK. Right, thank you very much indeed to, to all my panel. Thanks to all of you that have made it through, maybe frozen in our seats. Um, <laughs> but most of all, thanks to our panellists, who I think have given us a lot of information, a lot of food for thought. Some of it slightly depressing, but some really important <laughs> sort of too positive much stuff as well. <laughs> in there. Thank you all very thank much. You. Thank you.